Sometimes, revolutions don't begin with shouts. They begin with silence. This kid's still blotch in a small German town called Freising. In the winter of 1875, a boy was born who barely cried. Ludwig, the second son of Alexander Prantl, an engineering professor, and a fragile mother who raised him surrounded by books and clocks. He didn't play with other children. Stories didn't interest him. He spent hours listening to the wind. At first, they thought something was wrong, that he didn't speak because he couldn't. But that wasn't it. Ludwig Prantl listened. He listened to the world, as if waiting for the universe to reveal a secret. At the age of six, he saw a drop of ink fall into a glass of water for the first time. He watched it silently for 15 minutes. When his father asked what he was doing, he answered, I want to understand why it spins before dissolving. That was his first experiment. There was no prize, no applause, only intuition, a quiet unrest that would never leave him. As a teenager, he suffered from insomnia. Some nights, he would walk in circles around his house, wrapped in blankets, listening to the creak of the trees. He wrote everything down, measured what no one else did, evaporation time, smoke direction, the resistance of wind against wet paper. At 17, his teachers called him brilliant, but none truly understood him. He wasn't looking for answers. He was studying the behavior of mystery. He entered the Technical University of Munich, methodical, quiet, uncomfortable in class. He never argued, but his notes were so precise they seemed written by a machine. One day, a professor called him aside and asked why he never spoke up. Prantl simply said, I'm not ready yet to talk about what I hear. Then came the moment that would change his life. His encounter with a mentor, August Feppel, a man who saw in Ludwig something others didn't, not just knowledge, but vision. Feppel encouraged him to study mechanical engineering and, without knowing it, unleashed a silent storm that would transform the study of air, water, and chaos. But in that moment, Prantl only wanted to build a wind tunnel in his basement and watch the smoke dance, as if the wind were speaking to him, as if it knew that someday he would answer. Year 1904 Ludwig Prattl is no longer a child. He is 29 years old, his hair neatly combed, his gaze distant. He works at the University of Hanover, but in secret, in a poorly ventilated room, he has spent weeks building something, a handcrafted wind tunnel. He's not doing it to publish. He's not doing it to impress. He's doing it because something won't let him sleep. Why does air cling to surfaces? A mystery everyone takes for granted, a question no one dares to ask because no one thinks it makes sense. But Prantl doesn't think like the others. One ordinary afternoon, he lights a cigarette, gently blows the smoke over a flat plate, and he sees it. First a line, then a curve, then a rupture. The transition between laminar flow and turbulence. And in between, a thin strip, a zone. The boundary layer. There, between order and chaos, he finds an invisible bridge. A region no one has described, no one has measured, but one he has felt since childhood. It is as thin as a whisper, he would later write, and as powerful as a storm. He presents his discovery at the Heidelberg Congress. Ten minutes, a couple of diagrams. The room falls silent. Silence, not a single question, 
Not a single objection. No one understands what just happened. For months, his work is ignored. But in France, in the United States, in England, engineers begin to read him. To do the unthinkable, to change the design of the world, his theory of the boundary layer begins to appear on aircraft blueprints, in wind tunnels, in wartime laboratories. But he does not celebrate. He does not stop. He does not seek fame. He returns to his lab, lights another cigarette, and keeps watching the smoke. As if the wind still had something left to tell him. 1933, Adolf Hitler rises to power, and with him a shadow falls over Germany. Science, art, and freedom tighten, like the wing of an aircraft just before it breaks. Ludwig Prantl is now nearly 60 years old. He directs the Institute of Mechanics in Göttingen. He is a symbol of German engineering. His students admire him. His theories already fly over Europe. But now, the wind he once loved begins to whistle differently. He has offered funding, new laboratories, unlimited access to resources, but with conditions. Collaborate with the regime. Prontel hesitates. He is not a politician, nor a zealous patriot. He is a scientist. And for that reason, he accepts, not out of ambition, not out of ideology, but for a belief as old as it is dangerous. Science must go on, no matter what. The years pass. What was once curiosity is now military strategy. They design aerodynamic profiles. They calculate compressibility. They test wings at supersonic speeds. And though Prontel never designs a weapon, his theory feeds those who do. He grows quieter, more methodical, more absent. Reports circulate, orders arrive sealed, experiments continue. Then one night, a wind tunnel test fails, a wing model breaks loose, a technician dies, and Prontel says nothing. He does not testify, he does not protest, he does not resign. He simply locks himself in. And for the first time in decades, he does not light his cigarette, because he knows this time the smoke would not let him sleep. 1945. The war is over. The Third Reich has fallen. The laboratories have been dismantled. The skies have gone silent. But the Göttingen Institute still stands. Cold. Empty. Watched. Allied troops walk its halls. They find half-burned blueprints, calculations on shock waves, models of supersonic wings, fragments of a dream that brushed against horror. And in the middle of it all, him, standing before a chalkboard, alone, motionless, as if time had stopped, waiting for an answer. He isn't arrested. He isn't judged. The Allies know his name. They respect him. Some even admire him. But Prantl doesn't feel victorious, nor redeemed, nor understood. Outside, the world rebuilds. Inside, he falls apart. His former students have fled. His colleagues are silent. His institute is now an empty echo of what once was. In the years that follow, Prantl formulates no new theories, gives no lectures, leads no more projects. He only corrects, revises, organizes, as if trying to clean the dust from something that can no longer be saved. He writes letters he never sends, starts treatises he never finishes, jots down ideas he never shares. And in every line, in every formula, a shadow, doubt, guilt, 
the echo of chaos. One afternoon, while observing a simulation of flow over a sphere, he murmurs, it's beautiful and terrible. His young assistant asks, are you talking about the model, Professor? Prantle doesn't answer, because he wasn't talking about the model. He was talking about humanity, about knowledge without control, about what happens when wind becomes a weapon. That night, he lights a cigarette and watches the smoke rise, just like before, but different. It no longer dances. It no longer inspires. It no longer speaks. It only rises and disappears. 1953, a windless afternoon in Göttingen. Ludwig Prantl sits in his study at peace. He is 78 years old. He has survived two wars, a scientific revolution and himself. On his desk, a blank sheet of paper and beside it, his last cigarette. He watches the smoke rise just as he did when he was a child, when he dreamed of questions no one else dared to ask. His breathing is faint, his pulse barely detectable. A young man sits with him, his closest student. He has come to say goodbye, to say thank you, to listen one last time to the voice of the man who taught him how to read the wind. Then Prontel speaks. It's not a speech, not a lecture, just a phrase, soft, fragile. It's not about the air, but about what lies behind it. The student doesn't understand, but he nods and remains silent. Hours later, Prontel dies at home. No applause, no headlines, no ceremony. The world keeps turning, planes keep flying, and his name slowly dissolves. Years later, that student finds a forgotten box in the Institute. Inside, unsent letters, incomplete notes, drawings of smoke, and a single handwritten page. On it, an equation. Never published, never taught. A prediction about the instability of the boundary layer in hypersonic flows. A theory, decades ahead of its time, buried in silence. The student smiles. And then he understands. Prontel didn't seek fame. He didn't seek glory. He sought the impossible. To tame chaos, to translate the wind, to hear what only the silent can hear. Today, his formulas live on. In wind tunnels, in jets, in rockets. But he never saw them take flight. They say the wind has no memory, but some still listen and remember the whisper of a man who once said, it's not about the air, but about what lies behind it.